This is El Mirage, a dry lake bed in California. Much like the story of American watchmaking, it reminds us that even in the toughest of environments, time keeps on ticking. I'm coming up on right side bumper, about 60 miles an hour. Oh yeah, <laughs> sure. The story of watches in America is not so different from that of the auto industry. On three. Brace yourself. Both have a deep-rooted history in American culture and in the origins of mass production. Today, companies like Rivian, designing sleek, modern, and innovative vehicles, help keep an active appreciation for the idea of made in America. In this episode of Watches in the Wild, we set out to discover what watch culture looks like on the West Coast, in California, a state that has always pushed the boundaries of culture while fostering deep roots in America's past. Join Cole and me as we explore more of the modern American view of watches in episode three of Road Through America. To get grounded in LA watch culture, we met up with our friend and Hodinkee alum, Stephen Pulverin, who has lived and breathed the LA watch scene for a few years now. Unsurprisingly, he showed up with a handful of great watches and plenty of insight to share. I've always been a pretty like simple watch kind of person. Like I like- 1016? Yeah, exactly. I, I like simple things executed really well with a kind of distinct style and that works here and it works really nicely. I mean, I have this Tank American that I, love and I wore it a lot since I first got it but I find here like I really love wearing it with a t-shirt mm -hmm. or with a hoodie and just that. like not caring that it's a you know beautiful classic Parisian dress watch it's like no just throw it on with like a cream colored hoodie and go up to Malibu for lunch and like wow. there's nothing wrong with that man but, you know but another version of you will go to some uh you know cafe in Paris too totally. this, this is you too totally th with this watch yeah. and it's a fun way to kind of like split the difference right yeah. you know I get to I get to kind of have a little bit of each you spent a decade under the influence of watches in New York City now you're out here in LA and you're also in watches what's the difference between these two markets I would say that the misconception is that LA watch culture is homogenous, right? There's this idea that it's Rolex sport watches or gold Royal Oaks and that's it. And like, that's all anybody's wearing. That's not the case. And it's cool to see how each person kind of carves their own niche, whether they're somebody who's really into like Seiko divers or whether they're somebody who's really deep into like hyper complicated paddock and precious metals. You get the full, the full spectrum and then the independence community here is actually amazing. Mm, yeah. uh, there are a I've lot of people I've met out here For who sure. are, are deep into, you know, Jorn, Debethune, Urwerk, like that yeah. kind of stuff. You know, you see uh, the car culture here is heavily based in modified and custom and, and that sort of stuff. And you see some of that in the watch space as well. And I think that's what always has kind of shined for me here. So it doesn't surprise me that more avant-garde brands Especially like in an Urwerk, I want to live somewhere where I'm in a t-shirt all the time anyway, yeah, right? true, true, true. Uh, not something I want to have to hide under a cuff. It's no surprise that the watch culture of LA is heavily connected to that of cars. The appreciation for both industries is seen just about everywhere you look. From iconic watch designs inspired by classic car aesthetics to watches designed specifically for professional race car drivers. The LA vibe is Steve McQueen, the king of cool, roaming the canyons in a fast car with a great watch on his wrist. One of the best places to illustrate the intersection of watches and cars is at a car meetup, a staple of the LA car scene. The weekly Good Vibes Cars and Coffee at Newcomb's Ranch on the amazing Angeles Crest Highway is a prime example. On the wrist is this uh Old BWC chronograph, Valju 7733, and it's got these super cool subdials, big sculpted um, indices, yeah. and it's just got a lot of character. It oozes sort of 60s, 70s. A lot 70s. of fun. Yeah, totally. Yeah. 
So, boys, I see a, an interesting thematic uh, approach to car and watch enthusiasm is happening on your wrist and right here with your vehicle. What are we wearing and what are we driving? I have a Langa 1815 annual calendar. Okay, you brought the fire. It took me a whole two minutes to set up. <laughs> and got my birth here, uh, 2002. Wow, all right. Well, the carbureted. And did you put that on specifically because you're driving this car today? I did. I, I, I saw the, the, the contradictions here. You know, uh -huh. one, one design trying to be historic. Yeah. And then the other one, historic, trying to be new. And you good, sir. Today I've got the uh, Seiko Monopusher that they originally produced for the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. Yeah. Yeah. That's a rare one. This one's actually new old stock. I've only just resized the bracelet. Okay. I just love these Seiko Monopushers. Like they're, they're useless, but they're amazing. Yeah, they're cool. Yeah. And sometimes it's just about having fun. Exactly. I drove my 2017 Subaru BRZ. Dig it. I just got this in February. Okay. I started working at uh, Jane Shapiro Watches and Eric had this Miata. He uh, oh, drove me up here to get my breakfast club and around, and I'm just like, oh man, I gotta get something. My most recent acquisition, my uh, Belova Accutron Space View. This is 60s. Yeah. And uh, got my 60s Olympus camera too, so. <laughs> this is a Casio G Shock. This is a collaboration that Casio did with a Hawaiian company called Information. I love it. I've had it for 10 years now, and, and I wear it often. Whether it's the precision of a finely crafted movement or the roar of a high performance engine, there's something about these machines that speaks to our innermost desires for beauty, innovation, and experience. For me, the joy of collecting watches and exploring the world of horology is very much tied to the same sense of excitement and adventure I feel when I'm behind the wheel of a special car. The passion that collectors share for cars and watches runs deep. And someone who really digs into that passion is my friend and LA Times reporter, Daniel Miller. He's covered some really fascinating watch and car stories, and he's also a consummate car enthusiast and watch collector. Do you think that there's any sort of a through line or like similarities in terms of collector fascination or enthusiasm, whether it be with watches or cars, or do you see a connective thread that's like either like a, has a West Coast vibe or even just a, a uniquely sort of American uh, vibe? That's a good question. I've been thinking a lot about what it means to be a collector recently, not just of watches, but mm -hmm. of other things too. I read this great book called uh, The Man Who Loved Books Too Much. You know, it basically makes the point that obsession is baked into collecting and collecting requires like a willingness to immerse yourself in something. It can be competitive, it can be, you know, academically rewarding, it can be, you know, something that brings people together. And, you know, those are all the reasons why, why it's fun for me to collect watches. This is a Benrus Ultra Deep 6088. And, um, you know, some people will tell you that the CIA used these watches, and there's all sorts of stories about this reference. And I think most people, when they think Benrus, they think of like the Mark I or the Mark II. This watch, I fell in love with the loom on this watch. I mean, there's just so much of it. I was working on a story last year about a pocket watch that had been commissioned for JP Morgan. I spent about a year on this story. This was this super complicated pocket watch with something like 18 complications from a small English firm called J Player & Son around 1905. It took four years to make. It essentially bankrupted J Player. J.P. Morgan dies uh, only a couple years after he receives the watch, and his death sort of touches off this long journey for the pocket watch. It changes hands many, many times when I pick up the story and decide, like, what if I could find out what actually happened to this watch? There's like a 50-year gap from the 1970s. And that's what I spent a long time immersed in. You know, I think, like a lot of other people, I think of watches as a way to mark a special occasion or something like that. I had my eye on one of these Ultra Deeps, and I told myself this is gonna be sort of to commemorate working on this watch story. This example, when I bought it, there was issues with the crystal fitment and I talked to a few watchmakers, people don't wanna take this on, they don't know about this, the parts are scarce, but I find out on a dive watch message board that there is a, a watchmaker in Arkansas who for some reason has become the expert in these, in these Benrises. So I send him the watch, I think he charged me 50 bucks and he fit a crystal onto it and it's been running great. One thing that people may not 
realize is how how generous and open I find the world of, of watch collecting. And the fact that you can just ring a guy up in Arkansas and say, I hear that you know how to work on Benris Ultra Deep 6088s. And have I got one for you? Do you think that might be just a reflection of the fact that it's a transplant fascination here? There's not that much American watchmaking these days. It's coming back, it has its, it has its pockets, but so much of it is based somewhere else and sort of supported here just based on raw enthusiasm? Yeah, you know, I hadn't thought of that, but I think that that must be true. I mean, like, you know, the seat of power for watchmaking is in, is in Geneva, right? right? And in Switzerland. And for a time it was in England but before it was there. For many people, like, you don't grow up immersed in the culture. You know, there's not like some storied maison down the street that, yeah. you know, has been there for 300 years making watches. And so here I think we have more freedom or flexibility to take it where we want to go. It's clear that the spark behind a lot of what collectors want comes from a great story. Something like this classic Datsun 240Z that was originally owned by Daniel's grandfather. He's had it for over 20 years and keeps it because he loves it and because it reminds him of family. I'm curious, what's the story behind the, uh, the license plate frame? So the license plate frame uh, when I got the car, it didn't have a frame on it, mm -hmm. but I just sort of figured, you know, my family's Datsun dealership must have had license plate frames. So I set up an eBay alert, and years later, it finally pinged. He wanted something like $400, and I messaged him on eBay, and I said, listen, you're not going to believe this, but that was my family's dealership. My, my grandfather started this dealership. Any way you can make a deal on it, and wonderful guy, sold it to me for something like 100 bucks, and it's been on the car ever since. The freedom of the American watch industry Daniel brings up is something that we can see firsthand with Josh Shapiro at JN Shapiro Watches. Much like RGM, Josh is creating high quality independent watches and developing a cult like appeal in the process of designing and building watch parts in house with the goal of creating movements that are 100% made in the USA. My dream is to make a watch entirely in-house. In-house is such a vague term and a lot of people mean like a watch that we've designed and someone else has made, but it's proprietary to us, so it's in-house. It's in-house. But you know, I was deeply inspired by George Daniels and Roger Smith, so that's my dream, right. to do it all here. And that means we can say fully American made too. You will essentially be writing a new chapter of American horological history. It's been a dream of mine since I got into this. You know, even Guilloche, which I love, I never just wanted to be a dial maker. I always wanted to build a business that was capable of bringing back this industry. So this is a Rose Engine machine. This was made in the 1920s in Great Britain. They're beautiful and it's really meditative to use these machines. This is a system that allows you to very precisely move the dial against a cutting surface, yeah? Correct, exactly. And it's tracing a geometric pattern onto the metal. So it's very old technology. There's no motors on these machines, but the things you can do with it are nearly limitless. The core of American watchmaking was founded on mass production, which was ultimately adopted all around the world. But to compete in today's market, small brands like Shapiro's aren't looking to become the next Waltham or Hamilton. Rather, Shapiro and his compatriots are creating their own cottage industry within the watch market, one that doesn't rely on parts or support from Switzerland. Do you see yourself as a sort of hybrid of those two methodologies, the big integrated sort of factory that can basically see the, the, the progression of every little element into a final product that also leverages some of the strength of the Swiss system? What we're trying to do is, is very different because we're not going for mass scale. We want to be an independent that puts out you know, 50 to 100 watches a year. For that to happen, we can't do it in the spirit of George Daniels that was all doing manual machinery. You know, we have to have the automatic machines, the CNC machines. And then where we can, we try to put as much 
handcraft as we can into it, into the beveling, into the finishing, into the engine turning, of course. Doing exactly like George Daniels, you made one watch a year. Yeah. I can't stay in business doing one watch a year. Do you see it eventually being a 500 watch, a 1,000 watch, or is like the natural size for you is more like the 50 to 100? We'll have to see. It's the Kari Vutalainen model versus the Jorn model. You know, right. Jorn is at 800, 900 watches a year. Kari Vutalainen is around 100. You know, there are things Kari can do that Jorn can't in terms of customizations because his numbers are lower. So we'll just have to see where we want to take it. We have one of our tantalum cases that is just in the beginning process of uh, having the main material machined away and it's going to be left just with the lug profile. What are the benefits to the wearer, to the owner? Why tantalum? Well, it's got the same weight and feel as gold, but it's a stealthy material. No one on the street is going to realize that it's an expensive, rare, interesting material. And it's also a much richer color, like almost like a blue-grayish mm -hmm. color to it. Yeah, interesting luster. All made here in-house. Do you think that the, the number of available hands has an effect on the scope of the audience, of those who might be interested in the work or find it? You know, there's only three or four watchmaking schools in the country, right. and those usually have around 10 seats in it. So our output of watchmakers is really small, really small. In terms of the demographic or breakup, would you find that having such a focus on doing stuff here where we're sitting means that you have more American clients than you might if you were doing some stuff in Switzerland and it had Swiss on the dial, that sort of thing? Yeah, I think so. I think uh, that's attractive. And it's not just in the United States, you know, I have more than half my customers are, are global. Right. And that's because we try to make our quality as high as possible on an international standard. You know, we want to compete with the best of the Swiss. We want our watches to hold up to any other in the world. All right, so here's a serious question. If you had the money to buy either a Jorn or Shapira, both independents, like after seeing Shapira's watches in the metal, right? I would lean towards the Shapiro not only because I saw, because I've seen some of the stuff that goes into a Jorn, yeah. and it's awesome. I don't think you can discredit one no, at, the, at, at the benefit of the other. Not at all. But there is something really impressive about the Shapiro thing, and it's a vibe that feels so like cottage industry yeah, at exactly. the same time. I think you, you get a personal touch that isn't even available when you talk about the number of watches that Jorn makes. Right. Right? You could talk to Josh. You could... Um, customize. Customize it. He talked about having clients like actually come in and do some of the basket weave. Yeah, which is very like, cool. Like do one line of the infinity weave on yeah. their own watch. I would that's not trust myself. Wild. It would, oh, it would I wouldn't ruin either. my own watch. Yeah, yeah right? <laughs> But like that's really cool if you're it if is. you're that engaged, yeah. and I think it's a depth thing, right? Like I think as much as the price point might be similar, and maybe the watchmaking is similar in some respects between a Jorn and a Shapiro, like you're you're a level deeper yeah. with Shapiro. 100%. It's so so what you're buying is specificity. Yeah. The classic stylings of Shapiro watches got us both thinking about some other classic models, car models to be exact and one of the most impressive car collections on the planet exists right here in LA at the Peterson Automotive Museum. As a special treat, they actually let us into their vault to check out some of the coolest cars that weren't actively on display at this incredible museum. Which one are you taking? I need something a little sportier, maybe something, uh, I need a hat to go with any of these, I think. <laughs> and a pair of goggles. Yeah, maybe some goggles, a pipe. So, I mean, if you want to talk American icons, I, I, at least from my perspective, you cannot leave this out. Yeah. It's a Ford GT40. This is a 67, so it's a Mark III. Uh, this is a really important car. This would have come out the year after Ford beat Ferrari mm -hmm. at Le Mans. If you've seen Ford v Ferrari, if you read A.J. Baim's incredible book, uh, Go Like Hell. I mean, these are just drop-dead cool. Yeah. 53 Cadillac, bodied by Ghia. So this is a 54 Plymouth Explorer. I mean, that's a lot of car. Uh, that was from Awesome Powers, the Beetle, uh, and then from Little Miss Sunshine, yes. the, the VW Buck. Yeah, uh, what a movie too. Yeah, pretty cool. And then here, we get to this uh, yellow De Tomaso, yep. owned by a pretty famous American, 
You ain't nothing but a hound dog crying all the time. We don't have the license for that, dude. Uh, but yes, this is uh, Elvis's De Tomaso Pantera, and it has a bullet hole in the dash, I'm told. This this is what I would expect from the Peterson, right? Yeah. This is the kind of car that I think would be here. Yeah, th this is the sort of car you build a museum for. Literally. At, in crazy provenance as well, like a, a, any XKSS, any D-Type, these are old Jaguar race cars. This one obviously made for the road. This one happened to have a pretty special owner. Mr. Steve McQueen. Most people have heard of him. Yeah. Uh, you know, definitely known as kind of the California car guy. This became a bit of an icon to his personality. Mm. And now, in, in not, not in some ways dissimilar from like a Paul Newman Daytona. Yeah. Paul Newman's Paul Newman Daytona, a to be perfect clear. Perfect comparison. This is like a $50 million car. Wow. Well, that's... Surprisingly, they, they weren't keen on letting us take her for a spin. Well, the tour's not over yet. <laughs> Key's got to be here somewhere. Ooh. Yep, that's a Lakota. Do like. Yeah. Man, I want to fly a helicopter. That, I don't know what that is, but that's... Looks a little old. Yeah, it looks old. I like that Lakota. Of course, cars aren't the only means of travel that often depend upon reliable timekeeping. Our last stop in LA gives us another view of the culture here and its roots in personal freedom and exploration from the controls of a vintage TriPacer airplane. Evan Robinson, an LA-based photographer and pilot, kindly brought his collection by to show us a bit about its connection to the world of aviation and, of course, watches. So I'm curious, you said the plane's from the 50s, yep. right? What kind of life did this plane have before you uh, got your hands on it? Yeah, so in, in the 50s, it's kind of this beginning of the heyday of aviation where Piper thought that everyone was going to treat flying an airplane just like driving in a car. So they'll even notice that the handles on the doors, they just are car door handles. It looks mm -hmm. exactly like you're just getting out of your you know, mom's Cadillac. They wanted to make it really friendly. The controls look almost car-like. The car -like. controls look very car-like, and actually the Pacer um, was the exact same plane that uh, Sam Walton of Walmart. Okay. That's what he used to fly around from store to store, because it was the most economical way that he could get around in like these middling distances. And I see this, this is a true pilot's watch. I mean, the yeah. Sim 240 ST, one of my favorite watches of all time. Nine times out of 10, if you see me at the airport, that's the watch on my wrist. There is something about that internally rotating bezel that just brings me an undue amount of joy. I just mm -hmm. think it's a little <laughs> slice of perfection. I'm truly up in the air, I do actually use timers all the time. That's how we keep track of fuel, because mm -hmm. we're always, um, as pilots we talk about how many hours we can fly, not how many miles, everything mm -hmm. is time-based. Right. And so I love having a watch that is a real tool watch that I don't have to worry about though, if I need to get out and change the oil or fix something, you know, that thing is just a beast. Absolutely. A big fan. Yeah. My grandfather had been a pilot, and so the first time I was in the back of a small plane, I was about three months old. I just thought it was normal to get a little plane down from LA to Mexico. I thought like that's kind of how you got lunch. When I got a little older, found out that wasn't normal, and <laughs> for a long time didn't think that I would ever kind of catch the flying bug. But uh, once I caught it, I caught it really strong. And as soon as I got comfortable in the air, I realized that there were things I was seeing up there that were pretty hard to describe because most people, when you take off in a commercial jet, you think of how fast you hear that little ding that tells you you're at 10,000 feet. What's it, three or four minutes? Mm -hmm. 90% of the time in this little plane, we're flying 500 to 1,000 feet off the ground. And the views are incredible. There are patterns in nature that you can see from that kind of mid to low altitude that you really don't get a sense of when you're up high and that For sure. you have no ability to get perspective on if you're driving a car. When you got your license, you know, most people buy themselves a watch or something like that or, or do their license in a certain watch and so forth. What did you do yours in? So, ironically, now I've got a few pilot watches, but I actually did all of my private pilot training in a Patek 5167. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first watch that kind of got me into watches. Yeah. Um, and so I bought it about a year and a half before I started training, and I wanted to do the training with a watch that I remember. I thought, well, this one's as good as any. So, yeah. That's so that's... a year and a half before, what was the push to, to pick? Because that's not a normal, like, I got into watches by starting with a 5167. Yeah, well, a, a little similar to the way that, like, when I got into flying, I went from never having flown to having a license in 40 days. When I got into watches, like, okay, if we're going to do this, like, let's really do it. Yeah. And um, the the inciting event was that I was getting married, so I had an excuse to spend a little bit of money on a watch. Uh, sure. Okay, yeah. um, so, you know, finding something that could hold up to the tuxedo for that, but at the same time, yeah, 
I'm a guy that spends most of my time outdoors, flying or mountain biking or doing something. I wanted a watch that actually felt like you know, a rubber band watch that could be wearing out and about. And so as soon as I tried one, I was like, yep, yeah, this is it. It's yeah. comfortable, it's beautiful, I love it. It wears so easily. Looks good on you. Yeah, appreciate it. The watches that I love are all tool watches, just like the planes that I love are really, mm. they're tools, they're utility planes. The Big Pilot, for example, you know, it's big enough you can use it as a desk clock, but actually the size of that face is really similar to the size of the instruments in the plane. Mm. And so as you're doing a scan, checking, okay, what's the altitude, making sure everything's set, it's really nice because I can look at my wrist and it feels like an extension yeah. of what the rest of the cockpit is. Right. So that's a tool that's really useful to me. I'm gonna call up tower real quick. Sure. Lightman Tower, Tripacer 4770 Alpha, New Hall Pass with Lima bound to land. General aviation is this really funny term, and it's the catch-all for everybody that flies that isn't a commercial airliner. There's about 600 airports in the U.S. with commercial service. Mm -hmm. There are about 6,000 airports that you can land at if you have your own means of getting there. Wow. Yeah. We have totally unique freedom in the U.S. to go out and fly. We're going to listen to the weather information, we're going to call up the tower, and about 60 seconds later we're going to be able to go take off. They're not going to ask us where we're going. We're mm -hmm. just going to tell them that we are responsible pilots and they know we're going to avoid any airspace we can't go into. That's incredible. Yeah. We can decide to go out onto the coast and go see if there's some whales out there. We can go fly up in the mountains and go check out what's happening. I mean, it's complete and total freedom. We have uh, the responsibility to manage it safely, but with that comes the privilege of getting to go wherever we'd like to. Yeah, uh, yeah. The U.S. is the best place in the world for flying. Oh, it's Hands just down. incredible. Yeah. It's just incredible. So what's the vibe in LA? I think as far as collectability, it's a love for all things mechanical. Whether it's watches, cars, planes, or all three, there's a deeper appreciation for how these things work and how they reflect the personality of Los Angeles and of California. What's underneath the hood or the dial matters. And the effort to produce these things here in America and share the hobby with a passionate community matters too. Like a lot of collectors in the world, we'd be the first to admit that obsession plays a large part in the process. But from what we've seen in LA, that's not exactly a bad thing. On the next episode of Watches in the Wild, we'll head north on the Pacific Coast Highway to check out Fire Captain Asha Wagner's collection of dive watches, take a look into what super collector Eric Koo has on his wrist, and visit one man's epic collection of phonographs, jukeboxes, and some unique vintage watches from Hamilton. Mm -hmm.